Okay, Act 1, Scene 5. Are you ready for the greatest scene in all of Shakespeare? Um, we're introduced here to Lady Macbeth, as I mentioned. Uh, Macbeth is all excited that Duncan is going to come visit them, and he's got it in his mind, hey, I could be king. And so he writes a letter to his wife uh, and speeds it ahead of him and ahead of their retinue, the whole troop, you know, uh, Duncan and his and his retinue are, are on the way to Macbeth's castle. Now we get introduced to Mac Lady Macbeth here. Uh, she's all alone, and she's reading the letter that Macbeth has just sent. Uh, and then she goes into her very famous soliloquy. It's absolutely brilliant. The psychological depth is 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 staggering. Um, one of the greatest female characters ever written, I swear to God, Lady Macbeth. And so it's a rather short scene, but it reveals so much about these two. These two, they're intertwined. Their pathologies are, are just, they feed off each other in the most horrible way, the most recognizable way. You look around the people around you, hopefully not too badly in your own family, but in families around you, it's just, it's, it's staggering the depth here. So let me get into this. Um, and then I've got a lot of notes to talk about on the side. Okay, so Lady Macbeth reads a note. They met me in the day of success, and I have learned by the perfectest report they have more in them than mortal knowledge. So he doesn't say, hi, honey, the king is coming to visit us. He says, hi, honey, I met some witches, and they told me I'm going to be king. So what does that reveal about Macbeth? It reveals that he, we already know that he's the cat in the adage. He, he, want the, he wants the fish, but he doesn't want to get his feet wet. He's afraid of doing things but he knows that his wife will slap him around and force him to do it. So he, 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 he sends the letter. Let me just read this. So weak character, passive aggressive, knows he can't commit the murder on his own, knows his wife will encourage him. He's dependent on the judgmental wife. He sees opportunity to win her approval, prove he is a man in her own eyes, in her eyes. So this is why he, he tells her immediately about the witches. And she, she calls him on this later on too, when he tries to chicken out. Um, I burned in desire to question them further. They made themselves air into which they vanished. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, well, burned in desire, of course, that shows that he is ambitious. Whilst I stood wrapped in wonder of it, came missives from the king who hailed me Thane of Cawdor. Yay, I'm a Thane of Cawdor now. So he's, he's, going, it's, he's given her a blow-by-blow blow of what, what happened with the witches. By which title before these weird sisters had saluted me, and referred me to the coming on of time with hail king that shall be. So now Lady Macbeth is getting all, <laughs> I'm going to be queen. This have I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner in greatness. So he's already, he's planning it, and he knows that she's going to help him do this. That thou mightst not lose the dues of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness has promised thee. So honey, I'm going to make you queen. Now, Lady Macbeth, well, let's do this now. I'm going to do it eventually. Lady Macbeth is one of these characters. Now, Macbeth's weakness, as we've seen, it's horrible. He's an insecure man. And Shakespeare's great contribution to the world is to reveal what insecure men can do, almost as a kind of warning. Well, no, no, no. Shakespeare never wags his finger. He's never wagging his finger. Shakespeare just says, ladies and gentlemen, this is who you are. And then he walks away walks away. He just, there's, there's no finger wagging in, wagging in Shakespeare that I can see. Um, but anyway, we know Macbeth is pathetic. Well, if a man can be pathetic, then a woman can certainly be pathetic too. This is kind of the typical, the typical way for a man to be pathetic is that way. He's weak and he's so he's insecure and so he's a bully and he, he punches people up and to prove that he's a man or whatever. You watched uh, or you read Of Mice and Men, that novel, you know, curly, little curly. He's the little man syndrome he wants to prove to everybody that he's tough and he bullies everyone well here's the female version of that the typical female version of that there are physically violent females out there and there are horribly um you know manipulative men out there as well but women tend to be when they when when they are horrible people they tend to be more of psychologically horrible more manipulative so so she is uh, the devouring mother archetype, the great mother in her negative aspect. Uh, she's manipulative. She's smart. She usurps the will of others for her own aggrandizement. That's what she does to Macbeth. She wants to be great. And you wait. Look at the language she uses at the beginning. I'll show you in a minute. She wants to be great, and she manipulates her husband to get what she wants. Um, traditionally, that's what all women had. Women weren't able to go out and become queens on their own. 
um, with the rare exception, Queen Elizabeth, Shakespeare's queen, ironically, but you know what I'm saying. So they had to resort to other means, these stratagems and these, these, these quiet, uh, quiet campaigns to get what they wanted and manipulate their husbands. Uh, she understands and exploits Macbeth's weakness. Now, this is what's so cruel. It's absolutely cruel. Um, what the devouring one of the one of the ploys of the devouring mother uh, is that they they withhold love. They use love as a weapon. I won't love you if you don't kill Duncan. Now, hopefully, your family's not like this, but look around your neighborhood. Watch the dynamics of the of of how the parents treat the child. Because I know I've seen it. The devouring mother is the one that says, I won't love you if you don't do exactly what I want you to do. Uh, it's it, and it's devastating. It's devastating because the child wants nothing more than to please the parent and they'll do anything. Uh, it can, it can, yeah, it, it's awful. And if, if it, that happens to a boy, for example, the boy grows up uh, and marries the mother, marries the, someone who marries a wife who behaves just like the mother behaved in the attempt to try it. If I can please this wife, then it's weirdly psychologically pleasing my mom that I'm a good boy, I'm a good boy, am I a good boy, am I a good boy? So we marry our parents when it's in a pathological uh, situation. It's absolutely horrible. So my theory, and I can't, there's no real evidence in the play for this, but I think Macbeth's mother was a Lady Macbeth. I think Macbeth's mother was must have been the devouring mother. Uh, and so Macbeth just, that's the pattern that was established in Macbeth's early childhood, and he continues that, and he found that attractive in his um, in his wife choice of wife. The Sopranos. If you go back and watch the Sopranos TV show, another oh that that show was as psychologically like Breaking Bad. Those two shows had penetrating psychological insight, uh, very similar on par, I'd say, with Shakespeare. Anyway, there was a similar thing there. Traditional female power is psycho-emotional rather than physical. Yes. So one of the great themes here is, is this is the horrible man theme, the insecure men theme. Uh, and this is the horrible woman theme, the love is a weapon. So traditional strength of female mother power, devouring mother archetype. I won't love you if you don't. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Okay, so I hope I didn't spoil anything here. I get excited when I talk about this because it is so cool. Um, she's the mother figure. Now watch this. Yeah, so so yeah, this is why I put this here because you get this sense of, you know, you ever watch little kids? Mom, look at me. Mom, look at me. And they're going to dive into the pool. Well, look at this. This is Macbeth. This is Macbeth getting ready to dive into the deep end of the pool. Mom, look at me. Look what I can do. I'm going to make you queen. It, it's, this, it's so sad. It's so sad. They're both so pathological. And she thinks that, she thinks she's, she thinks she enjoys this, but, but, I, but, but she doesn't. I think she thinks that he's pathetic. And, and then and she knows that he's never going to be able to do, he's so weak that she can manipulate him and therefore he can, he's never going to be able to accomplish what she wants him to accomplish because he's too weak to begin with. So it's just, it's this vicious circle. Anyway, okay, let me get into this. So she puts the letter down. She says, holy cow, gloms thou art. We all knew that. And you got the Commodore, cool. And you shall be what thou art promised. Look how confident that language is. You will be what you are promised immediately she says oh god but i'm married to this guy yet i do fear thy nature it is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way gorgeous poetry gorgeous too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way it's so important on so many levels if you play fallout 4 by the way that's a line in fallout 4 the video game it's pretty funny in that in that in in that context but in this context it's heartbreaking milk of course is a symbol of the feminine, and the feminine traditionally has been compassion, nurturing, tenderness. The women have to have that, at least to some degree, or babies will be just left dying in the fields everywhere. They've, they've got to have that compassion to, to nurture the kid for, God, what, 10 years when we were back in the, in the, in the living in trees? You, they had to, so 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 that's the classic feminine. And milk, of course, is l quite literally physically nurturing as well as emotionally. So look at the reversal here. There's a Greek term called peripatia. Um, I'm not so I'm not 
so snobby that I, I really enjoy all these old-fashioned Greek terms. But depending on the school you go to, uh, schools can focus on this stuff. And fair enough, that's, 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 that's cool too. But peripatia is a reversal. It's a change from one state to its opposite. Macbeth in this story begins as the hero, aligned with good, and he ends as the villain. So there's the peripatia. Another incidence of peripatia is, as we've, I think we've already t- discussed briefly, uh, Lady Macbeth starts in the masculine position. As Look at this scene. Macbeth is the one that's filled full of the milk of human kindness, not Lady Macbeth. She's filled with gall, or she thinks she is. She's not, though. She thinks she is. So there, the peripatia comes, and is really cool. I'm going to point it out. I actually pointed out, bam, that's where the reversal happens. Lady Macbeth starts off, you know, we're going to do all this. And Macbeth starts off, oh, what should we do? Can we do it? Can we do it? And he follows her. And then there's a moment here where she's cracking up. She doesn't like what she's doing because she's... She's not the person she thought she was. Total lack of self, self-knowledge. self They're totally, they're both of them morons. They're both of them lacking in all self-knowledge. They're mirror images of each other. They're the wrong person for the job. They both follow the wrong Hagrid. They're, they deserve each other. They deserve each other beginning to end. It's really fascinating. Anyway, okay, so uh, milk equals the feminine virtue of compassion, nurture, and tenderness. Macbeth is in the feminine role. Proof that Macbeth has a strong moral compass. You see, that's my thesis. That's my thesis. He has a strong moral compass, therefore is deserving of our pity and mercy. I don't know. Redemption. I talked about that already. I don't know. Okay. Um, okay, so you, I fear your character. It's it's You're too kind to get the quick way. You're too kind to kill him. You're going to want to wait and do it as, it as as it should be done. Thou would be great, art not without ambition, so you want to be, that means that you want to be. You, you, you would be, and you want to be great, and you do have ambition. You're not without ambition, but without the illness that should attend it. But without the illness should attend it. Now, there's a comment. Is that Shakespeare's comment on the world? If you want to get to the very top, you've got to be kind of nasty. There might be some truth in that. I'm not, I can't speak for everybody or every situation. But she's she knows her man. Now, this is another reason why I think Macbeth is... At heart, at the core of him, he's a good guy. He's a good moral man because the wife says he is. Now, you're married together for 15 years or more. You know each other. And and my argument might be that the woman knows the man better than the man knows the woman, perhaps. That's debatable and kind of hilarious. But you know what I mean. She knows him. She knows him. She knows him. And when she says that he doesn't have any illness in him, then we believe her. What thou wouldst highly, thou wouldst thou that wouldst thou holily. So the thing that you want the most in the world, you you, you do it by proper channels. You do it holily. You would not play false, so you're not going to cheat, and yet you would win through cheating. There's the cat and the adage. Adage: You don't want the fish, or you want the fish, but you don't want to get your feet wet. So you would let somebody else do the wrongness, and you'd benefit from that, but you don't want to play false yourself. Thou'dst have great gloms, that which cries, thus thou must do, if thou have it, and that which rather thou fears to do, than wishest it be undone. So the same kind of thing. You, it, this, this is really convoluted. That's, that's such complex language, but it, com- it boils down to the same thing. You want it to be done. He said it before. I, I want it to be done, but I don't want to have to do it because I'm afraid. So then she says, hie thee hither, come here, little boy that I may pour my spirits in thine ear. So there's the gross image of her pouring her her spirit, her evil spirit into his ear, which isn't so evil. She wants it to be. And chastise with the valor of my tongue all that prevents thee from the golden round, the crown, which fate in the guise of the witches and metaphysical aid, the witches, doth seem to have thee crowned with all. So you seem to have it all. So they're totally counting their chickens before they hatch. So there's, there's something moronic, total fools. Lady Macbeth, ambitious, manipulative. She's the lord of the house. Yeah, I kind of, I, I, she, yeah, so she starts off. She starts off as the lord of the house in the dominant position. He starts off in the, as the lady in the house. Um, yeah, so she's going to whip him into shape. I will encourage you. I will inspire you to do the nasty deeds that are required that your milk of human kindness don't, allow you to do um okay so uh enter a messenger the messenger says she says what's going on the king's coming here tonight and she just 
goes, oh my God, the king's come here tonight? You're mad to say it. Is not thy master with you? Where's Macbeth? Who were it so would have informed for preparation so that he would have prepared me? Well, don't you think this stupid letter should have prepared her? He didn't even think to announce that the king is coming. So please you, it is true, our thane is coming. So Macbeth is coming soon. One of our fellows had the speed of him. So there's all, there's all these horses running. And if you have a messenger that's trained, that's actually a delivery guy, he's going to be the fastest. So he's pulled out in front. And then Macbeth comes next, as you'll see. And then the whole heavy retinue of the king and his boys. And I don't know, they, no, no girls, all the boys coming. So that's the train. One of my fellows had the speed of him, who, almost dead for breath, had scarcely more than what... Yeah, okay, so they, they raced to get here. So give him tending, he brings great news. So, so give, the, give the king uh, tending, he brings... Yeah, this great news. No, the messenger. So, so, no, sorry. Take care of the messenger. We thank him for the news. So now she turns, and, and now he goes. He goes, and she turns, and she's alone now. So this is, another, this is the continuation of the soliloquy. And look at the similar imagery. It's the it's that it's that hell imagery that uh, that uh, that wasteland imagery starts to starts to starts to rise. Um, the raven himself is horse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. So she he, she hears that call and that becomes there's there's four things there's this raven there's an owl there's a bell and there's the cry of women there's like four very ominous off stage cries that. That I'll talk about later on, and this is the first of them. Uh, they symbolize fate. They symbolize um, the, in, the inevitability of human folly, the sad inevitability of human folly, as I kind of like to think of it, um, and the entrance of hell, the emergence of hell into Scotland, into the world, because they will make it a wasteland. They will make Scotland a wasteland, and this is the harbinger of the wasteland. Now look at the language. See, you look at language. Um, I talk about in a later video, I think, I talk a lot about the A analysis. You're looking at anal you're looking at a poem. How do you how do you get into the poem? How do you see what you're supposed to see? Ask yourself some questions. Why A, why not B? Why my? Why not our? What would if it what how would this sentence have changed if this said under our battlements? Totally different. You know it, you feel it. So just replace it. When you see an A on the page, my, replace it with something that's not A and see how the tone changes, how the meaning changes. Well, what does this tell us about Lady Macbeth then? She's the lord of the house, and she's very, very egotistical. I read a statistic somewhere where um, by, uh, in couples therapy, the psychiatrist can tell if they're gonna end up in a divorce by, by counting how often the couples use the pronoun I or we. Couples that use the pronoun I, 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 pff, forget about it, because they're not thinking of, of each other as a unit. They're thinking of themselves as the, the singular unit. And so they, they got nothing. They got nothing. So here she is with the my. Um, under my battlements, come you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Famous, famous words. This, this whole speech is very famous. Well, here's what she's doing. She's actually calling on the powers. Macbeth is actually going to go and meet the powers. He met the, he met the messengers of the darkest powers, the witches, and he's actually at, towards the end of the play, he's actually going to go and meet the spirits themselves. Um, here she is calling up these spirits. She's calling up the forces of hell. She's calling up the wasteland spirits to come and do what? Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts and unsex me here. She doesn't want to be a woman anymore. Again, the woman being associated with the passionate virtues, the feminine virtues. I'm just going to say that the feminine, traditionally feminine virtues versus the masculine virtues. And the masculine virtues are strength put to good use. I'm going to simplify it like that. Strength put to good use, not corrupt strength, but strength put to good use. That's what we saw Macbeth performing at the beginning of the play, and it was beautiful. He saved a kingdom. Uh, now she's going to take that strength and, 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 and give the shadow definition of it, which is the corrupt version of strength, strength put to corrupt purposes for the aggrandizement of the individual, tyranny. Lovely, big, big, big stuff. So she wants to be unsexed. I don't want to be a woman anymore. Because in her mind, her definition of, of the masculine is just pure, raw, brute strength. And that's what this whole thing is about. Definition of manhood. That's 
my number one theme for this whole play. I think it's, it's, it's Shakespeare's real concern in this play, what constitutes a real man. Well, Macbeth says many times, he says, a man is the marriage of masculine strength with feminine compassion. 50-50, 60-40, 70-30, I don't know. You, you can figure that stuff out. Lady Macbeth, defi- and Macduff does that as well. Macduff says that later on in the play. Lady Macbeth defines brute strength, and she's doing it right now. This is what you see. A man is brute strength only, the masculine only, no yin within the yang. Uh, you know those symbols, right? Those are the, the comes from, from China, and it's a gorgeous symbol because it's the masculine. Predominant, I'm male, so I'm predominantly masculine, but if I don't have that element of feminine in me, that compassion, then I'm, I'm a monster. And that's what we get at in this play very, very soon. But that's, that's Lady Macbeth's definition. Just be the monster. Just be the monster. Get what you want. Get what you want. Go, 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 go. And Macbeth is trying to argue from a cowardly position, as you'll see. No, no, no. I have to marry the two, those two elements. So the masculine without the feminine is a monster. And the feminine without the masculine, perhaps, is this, is this archetypal uh, uh, dragon lady, this archetypal um, devouring mother perhaps. Um, okay, so where were we? Yeah, yeah, well, sorry, where the hell down here? Um, so come, come, you spirits of tender mortals, unsex me here and fill me from the top of my head to my toes full of cruelty. Perfect. Make thick my blood so that it stops up the axis and passage to remorse. So the blood is, moves the passions and I want you to thicken it up so that the compassion can't have access to me. Stop up access, uh, stop up access, stop up the access and passage to remorse. I don't want to feel remorse. Like that woman in Breaking Bad who wanted to be, who wanted not to see willful blindness. That, so that no compunctuous visitings of nature shall shake my fell purpose. Now, she's afraid of her own nature. So right, right from the beginning, she recognizes that there are cracks in her theory. Her theory is just make me 100% man, 100% brute man but she's afraid of her own nature, her own compassionate nature, revealing itself and shaking her evil determination to kill Duncan. She wants to be able to do it. Well, doesn't this sound familiar? It sounds very similar to Macbeth, and it will later on. He says similar things. Metaphor. Milk, the feminine virtue of compassion, nurturing, and tenderness. Nor keep peace between the effect and it. Yes, so I don't want anything to interfere with, I don't want any feelings to interfere with this act. And she continues calling on the spirits. This is called an apostrophe, by the way. There's lots of them in this play. An apostrophe, I think I've already mentioned, uh, is when you speak to something, oh, whatever, whatever, that can't hear you. So she's still talking to these spirits, and she says, come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall. Replace my milk for some kind of bitter gall, bitter um, bile. Oh, you murdering ministers, wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief. So wherever you are, off in that evil land, Come and take my milk for gall. Replace my nurturing milk for poison. Now, it's interesting that Lady Macbeth doesn't have any kids either. Um, We don't quite know. I hope I'm not wrong on this, but I don't think they had a kid and it died, which has happened all the time, of course. But anyway, we we don't know. They're childless. So here's another question too. If if here's the dark side, of, here's the dark feminine side. The dark male side is that if you don't prove you're a man, you're you're you know you're just a girl. So that's horrible and weak men can't abide that. So if you don't have lots of sons, you're not a real man. So that's the dark side of of the the masculine nature. The dark side of the feminine nature is it similar? If they don't have children, they're failures too. They're failures in the, well, the kind of in terms of the natural progression of all life on the planet, they're biologically failures, just like the man is a biological failure. So what does that do to the female psyche? We just, we, I just talked about what that does to the male psyche. The female psyche might do the same thing. There might be something that gets twisted and bitter and they look out on the world and there's all these children and their instincts are kicking in and that makes them sour. And Joker, here's a female version of the Joker. Um, it's very interesting to, to think about, um, uh, and, and of course, ultimately very sad. Um, come thick night, and pale thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, so that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, hold, hold. So here she's calling on night to make it really dark, so that my keen knife doesn't see the wound it makes. Now there's the echo of, of Macbeth, it's the same thing. Two reasons why she wants night to hide her. 
One is that she doesn't want to see the wound. She's the cat in the adage too, but she throws that, she scapegoats that notion onto Macbeth. I'm not the cowardly cat, you're the cowardly cat. Well, I'll talk about scapegoating later. So she doesn't want to see the wound she makes, so she's not the psychopath she thought she was. Again, it's exactly the same as Macbeth. And just like Macbeth, she doesn't want to be stopped. Later on, Macbeth will say, oh, please don't, don't, uh, don't let anybody see me so I, that I, I can, so that I can successfully go through this murder, with this murder. Okay, awesome stuff. So Lady Macbeth, she's aligning herself with the powers of evil, the dark side. You know that from, that's, that's from, uh, I've got this in here as well, uh, down the bottom. Yeah, this part here. I don't know if I've shown you that yet. That's the moral dualism, dualism, Manichaeism. Manichaeism is an old, old religion from the Middle East where they, whereby the universe is divided into good and evil. These are all the, the these are all associated with the powers of evil and these with the powers of goodness. Uh, this, this notion informs everything from Christianity, Judaism, Islam, all of our, a lot of our uh, myths, and of course, our, our common understanding in popular culture of good and bad. Uh, Jung's shadow, not integrated, but in total control. So she, she's, yeah, that, that's the, the, the shadow is the, the dark side of yourself. Um, and when that's integrated, Jung said, when, it's, when, you're, when you're able to integrate that, that's what Macbeth did at the beginning of the play. He was able to commit horrors in the service of good King Duncan. That was his shadow. So he had his shadow, but his shadow was harnessed by his more moral understanding of, 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 of how he should behave in the world. And that made him do good and powerful things in the world, even though they were, you know, kind of horrible because he was cutting off heads and everything. Uh, Lady Macbeth wants that, sh- wants that shadow to have total control, to have no guidance from any other moral, um, moral systems. Just go, ravage the world for our own betterment. Horror imagery here parallels Macbeth's, of course. This is exactly the same conversation that Macbeth just had with himself. She's having with her herself. Now here comes the child. Oh, mommy, mommy, look, I just did a swan dive. Aren't you proud of me? Great gloms, worthy Cawdor, greater than both, by the all hail hereafter. So she's absolutely enraptured with her powerful husband now. He's going to be everything that she wants him to be and and, and therefore trans, thereby transport her to what she wants to be. Thy letters have transported me beyond this ignorant present, and I now feel the future in an instant. So again, she's an idiot. She's an idiot. No self-control, no impulse control. There's a term for you. Impulse control. Apparently, you know, the, the, one of the keys to, to success is impulse control. If you have it, there's a good chance you're going to be successful in life. If you don't have it, you're doomed. Well, look at these guys. These guys are pretty screwed too. Zero impulse control. Oh, I'm going to be queen. Let's go. Count all those chickens. I don't care if they're hatched yet. My dearest love, Duncan comes here tonight. And when, when's he leaving? Tomorrow, as he says, and she says, oh, no, 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 no. She's totally in control here. The sun shall never, that, uh, what? oh, never shall sun that morrow see. Your face, my thing. Okay, so that's not going to happen. Now, this is really cool, too. It goes back to what I said before about what she said. You know, your, what was it? Your face, you know, you're too full of the milk of human, human kindness. So this is, she, she, she knows her husband, and she says to him, your face, my thane, is as a book where men may read strange matters. So she's telling him right off that you're, you're naive, you're childlike, you're honest and good. She's basically telling him, you know, we're going to have a hard time doing this because everybody can read your face. You're too naive. You're not this monster that you have to become if you want to do this. So she's warning him. She's chastising him here. And she's saying, to beguile the time, look like the time. To fit the time, look like the time. To, to trick everybody in the, in the, in the room. You're going to have to, we're going to have to lie to everybody. We're going to have to smile to Duncan, smile to Macduff, smile to everybody. Meanwhile, we're plotting you know, a terrible murder. Bear welcome in your eye, your hand, and your tongue. Look at people smiling, smile, smile, say nice words. Now, this is beautiful poetry. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. Now, I say this. I can't count how many times I say this over the course of this channel, but you'll, you, maybe you can count them. Appearance versus reality, gorgeous, gorgeous. Again, appearance versus reality is probably the most, I don't know if I said this yet, it, it's appearance versus, versus reality is probably the most common 
the most universal theme in all of lit literature, because even if it's not fantastical literature, like Macbeth is kind of fantastical literature with witches and stuff like that, even if it's just like a, 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 a you know Jane Austen or something like that, like straight up storytelling of real life, realism, it's appearance versus reality. What seems to be the case, we live on the surface of our lives, and what the artist's job is is to pull back the curtain and to reveal what's on the inside. That's why we go to novels and good books and things like that. Uh, the king's coming here. The king's coming and he must be provided for, of course. And you shall put this knight's great business into my dispatch. So there it is again, under my battlements. She's the lady of the house. Sure, sure, she's the lord of the house. Which shall to all our knights and days to come give solely sovereign sway and master them. So this knight is going to determine our entire future and we're going to be king and queen hereafter. He tries to take, I, I love, again, I, I referenced the Ian McKellen, Judy Dench version, 1979, I think. Beautiful, beautiful. That's what's rattling around in my head, just so you know. Um, I really recommend you watch it. Uh, and Ian McKellen tries to, he tries to man up here. He tries to, to retake his position as man of the house. And he says, we will speak further. And then she just slaps him around. They actually switch positions on the stage. Uh, you know, on the, when, we, when we look at the stage, the left side of the stage is the dominant side. Uh, usually near a fireplace, the hearth is the dominant position. And so whenever the, what the director will do is when somebody has more power than the other one, they'll switch them around. The dominant person will be on the left. So in this Ian McKellen version, Judy Dench goes around. When she says this last line, she flips around and she ends up on the dominant side of the stage. There's some straight stagecraft for you. Now watch for that, watch for that. So she says, only look up fear, oh, sorry, only look up clear to alter favor ever is to fear. Leave all the rest to me. So she says, only you be careful here. She chastises him, don't show fear and don't you raise suspicions. So she's, she's wagging a finger at him saying, I know you. And then she says, leave all the rest to me, little boy. So there's the, there's the devouring mother and there's the poor little boy trying to please the mommy. Isn't it sad? How can you not have sympathy for this? This is what I meant by redemption. Now, I don't know about redemption, but certainly pity, good grief. Okay, so let me just read this in case I forgot something. Lady Macbeth chastises Macbeth. Don't show fear and raise suspicions. She knows he is not cut out for this job, which suggests to me that she's as foolish as the husband is to embark on this mission. They're amateur murderers and they're parallel characters. Yeah, so I spoke about all that. All right, so there you have it now. Now that you know what it's all about, go watch Judy Dench do this. Go watch her do this. It's amazing. Or some other good actors if you want. Okay, so that's Act 1, Scene 5.